Hello, so we continue from where we left off. So last time we saw that mere continuity isn't sufficient for us to prove that the partial sums of the Fourier series converges pointwise to f of x. The problem is when you try to write the difference between SN, the partial sums Sn fx minus f of x and estimate its absolute value, you take the absolute value inside the integral, you immediately run into difficulty because the Dirichlet kernel is highly oscillatory kernel, it is not a positive kernel and the integral of mod dnt dt from minus pi to pi behaves like c log n as you see in the slide in the, displays, uh, in the display. Now let us try to understand how to get around this difficulty. Why is it that instead of continuity, if we have holder continuity, slightly better than just continuity, then the problem is much uh, tractable. So before we take it up, let us expand the Dirichlet kernel. What is the Dirichlet kernel again? Let us see, it is basically 1 upon 2 pi, 1 upon 2 pi is an innocent constant factor, sin n theta plus theta by 2 and divided by sin theta by 2. The numerator, we use the addition formulas of sin. Sin of a plus b is sin a cos b plus cos a sin b. When you use this formula, you will get one term sin n theta cos theta by 2. The other term that you will get will be cos n theta sin theta by 2. The sin theta by 2 will cancel out in the second term. So that is exactly what we are trying to do now. What we do now is we expand the numerator in the Dirichlet kernel and we get sum of two terms dn theta equal to 1 upon 2 pi cos n theta plus sin n theta into cot theta by 2. Likewise, the integral 1.14 splits into a sum of two integrals. One of the integrals is cos nt times the difference f of x minus t minus f of x. f of x minus t minus f of x has been abbreviated to delta xt. It is very cumbersome to be writing f of x minus t minus f of x everywhere. So, I just abbreviate it to capital delta x comma t. So the integral splits into two integrals, integral minus pi to pi cos nt capital delta tx dt and the second integral, integral minus pi to pi sin nt cot t by 2 delta tx dx. The second integral that you see in 1.5 that gives you the trouble. Alright, let us move a little ahead. The first thing that we should do is to prove what is called as a riemann lebesgue lemma. So to handle the, to handle the first piece, integral minus pi to pi cos nt times delta tx dt. Again let us assume f is continuous so that delta tx is a continuous function of two variables. So now first piece, this first integral is an innocent piece. Why is it innocent? Why would it straight away go to 0 as n tends to infinity? Because of the next lemma called the riemann lebesgue lemma. What does the riemann lebesgue lemma say? If you have a function g in L1 of AB, if you have a function g in L1 of AB, theorem 3, then integral integral from a to b cosine nt into gt. That goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Likewise, integral a to b sine nt gt dt that also goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So this is 1.16 in the display. So we shall prove the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma later. 
and let us see how the Riemann Lebesgue lemma helps us. It helps us to cope with the first term in 1.15, namely integral minus pi to pi cos nt capital delta tx dt that goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Okay. Now to complete the proof that Sn fx converges to f of x as n tends to infinity, we need to secure that the second of the in two integrals in 1.15, the second one minus pi to pi sin nt cot t by 2 delta tx must go to 0, this integral must go to 0. How do you do that? First of all, let us do a simple exercise. Let us define a function capital F of t equal to cot t by 2 minus 2 by t if t is not equal to 0 and f of 0 is 0. How does cot t by 2 behave near the origin? Well, what is cotangent? 1 upon tangent. How does tan theta behave? Tan theta is approximately theta. So what is cot theta? Cot theta is approximately 1 upon theta. So cot t by 2 behaves like 2 upon t. So when I subtract 2 upon t, it's going to become nice because the ugly part in cot is the 2 by t part. So when I subtract 2 by t from cot t by 2, the function becomes nice. So this new function capital F of t, which is defined to be cot t by 2 minus 2 upon t when t is not equal to 0 and at the origin it is defined to be 0, that's a nice continuous function. And so the riemann lebesgue lemma says that integral from minus pi to pi f of t sin nt dt will be 0. So what we do is look at 1.17, you modify the integrand, add and subtract a minus 2 by t. So make it cot t by 2 minus 2 by t plus 2 by t. And now when you have cot t by 2 minus 2 by t, that is when you have capital F, use the next line here. So what we need to show is the 2 is an innocent factor, what we need to show is limit as n tends to infinity minus pi to pi integral 1 upon t sin nt times this difference capital delta xt that should go to 0 as n tends to infinity. This is so we are reduced the task to proving 1.18. So now comes the, now we bring in the hypothesis of Holder continuity. A function f from r to r is said to be Holder continuous of class alpha if mod f of x minus f of y is less than or equal to L times mod x minus y to the power alpha for all x, y in r. Here L is a constant, alpha is a positive constant, L is also positive. Now if alpha happens to be bigger than 1, then f is a constant, that's an exercise. So the only interesting case is when alpha is between 0 and 1, 1 included, 0 excluded. So alpha should be strictly positive and alpha should be less than or equal to 1. When alpha equal to 1, then the functions which satisfy this inequality are called Lipschitz functions. So Lipschitz functions are a special case of Hölder continuous functions. So now we are ready to prove the basic convergence theorem. So theorem 5, suppose f from r to r is a 2 pi periodic Hölder continuous function with Hölder exponent alpha positive and the Fourier series of f of x converges pointwise everywhere to f. This is theorem 5 in the in the displayed slide. So as I explained before, what is needed is to prove limit as n tends to infinity integral minus pi to pi 1 upon t f of x minus t minus f of x that is your capital delta xt times sin nt dt should be 0. Well, now it is very clear how to proceed. We should split the integral from minus pi to pi into two parts, an integral from minus delta to delta and the integral of the complementary part. So mod t less than delta, mod t greater than or equal to delta. So that is how I split the integral into a sum of two integrals. So in the first piece mod t less than delta, in the first piece mod t less than delta, we use Holder continuity. What happens is that mod of x minus t 
minus f x mod less than or equal to l times mod t to the power alpha. Remember the definition of holder continuity? So, we must use holder continuity on this difference, but this difference is denoted by capital delta. So, over here capital delta of t x in absolute value is going to be less than l times t to the power alpha. All right. So, we got the 1 upon t here, this capital delta t x is less than t to the power alpha and I am going to take the absolute value. So, this integral is less than or equal to L times integral mod t less than delta dt by mod t to the power 1 minus alpha because mod sin is less than 1 anyway, not a problem. Then the other integral, integral mod t between delta and pi 1 upon t capital delta t x sin n t dt. You compute this integral it will be 2 L upon alpha delta to the power alpha. Where do the 2 come from? It is an even function. Then the second piece, I have not done anything to the second piece yet. Now let epsilon greater than 0 be arbitrary. Select the delta so small that 2 L upon alpha delta to the power alpha is less than epsilon by 2. So the first piece here is already less than epsilon by 2 here. Now, we need to worry about the second piece. Remember that when mod t is between delta and pi, when mod t is between delta and pi, this business capital delta t x is a continuous function. And now, I can apply the Riemann Lebesgue lemma because 1 upon t is also continuous because 0 is far away. 0 is far away, we are between delta and pi. So, I can apply the Riemann Lebesgue lemma. So, this whole second piece goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So, I can select an n naught so large that this particular piece is less than epsilon by 2 and epsilon by 2 plus epsilon by 2 is epsilon. So, for n greater than or equal to n naught, it, this whole thing is less than epsilon and the proof is thereby complete. So, that completes the proof that when you have a holder continuous 2 pi periodic function, the Fourier series converges pointwise to the given function f of x. That was a little bit of work, but we will very soon see that we are going to derive some number of corollaries. In particular, it is also true for Lipschitz functions because after all Lipschitz functions are a special case of holder continuous functions. And our first example that we shall see presently is the case of a Lipschitz function. Well, we have to prove still the Riemann Lebesgue lemma. We have not done that yet. So, to prove Riemann Lebesgue lemma, we shall make use of two results. One is the Weierstrass's approximation theorem and the other is a theorem due to Nn Lusin. By the way, there are several proofs of the Riemann Lebesgue lemma and I have chosen this particular one. I will indicate some other proofs also. Okay, the first is a classic theorem called the Weierstrass's approximation theorem. I am pretty certain that most of you have seen the proof of the Weierstrass approximation theorem in your courses. So, let us recall the Weierstrass approximation theorem. A continuous function on a closed bounded interval a, b can be uniformly approximated by polynomials. That is an informal way of saying it. A little more formal way of saying it is in the second line. In other words, given a continuous function f on the closed interval a, b and an epsilon greater than 0, there exists a polynomial p such that the sup norm of f minus p is less than epsilon. In other words, the supremum of mod fx minus px over a less than or equal to x less than or equal to b is less than epsilon. The second theorem that we need is a theorem of Lusin. Now, the theorem of Lusin says that if a function f is in L1 and epsilon greater than 0, then there is a continuous function g such that the L1 norm of f minus g is less than epsilon. These are the two theorems that we shall use to complete the proof of the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma. 
So let's look at the Riemann Lebesgue lemma. The Riemann Lebesgue lemma says that if you have a L1 function g integral gt sin nt dt goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. So let us do the following. Let us take a simple example. Take g of t to be 1. Take the constant function 1. Integrate the constant function 1 times sin nt from a to b. You can integrate sin nt from a to b. You get minus cos nt upon n put the limits a to b and the denominator you have picked up a n and that goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. So we have already checked it when g is a constant function. You can check it for when g of t is t. You can prove it for g of t equal to t squared because you can actually compute these integrals, right? When g of t equal to t, you are going to be integrating t times cosine nt dt and you have to integrate by parts. But when you integrate by parts, you are going to pick up an n in the denominator. Again, it will go to 0. In particular, for all k equal to 1, 2, 3, etc., you can check the riemann lebesgue lemma is valid when g of t equal to t to the power k, k runs from 0 to infinity over the integers. So riemann lebesgue lemma has been verified. If the riemann lebesgue lemma is true for g1 and if it is true for g2, it is certainly going to be true for c1, g1 plus c2, g2. So it is going to be true for polynomials. So the riemann lebesgue lemma is true for polynomials g. Now we want to prove it for a, a general g. Take a general L1 function take any L1 function, by Lusin's theorem, we can choose a continuous function h such that integral from a to b, the L1 norm, remember, integral from a to b mod gt minus ht dt less than epsilon by 3, for example. Now, your h is a continuous function. Since h is a continuous function, appeal to Warstas approximation theorem, appeal to Warstas approximation theorem and you got a polynomial p of t such that the supremum of h t minus p of t is less than epsilon by 3 times b minus a. If the supremum is less than epsilon by 3 times b minus a, integral of g t minus p of t. What is integral of gt minus p of t absolute? It is going to be gt minus ht absolute plus integral of ht minus pt absolute. The first one is less than epsilon by 3. The second one will also be less than epsilon by 3. These two things will become less than 2 epsilon by 3. So using these two very simple approximations, we immediately get that integral from a to b mod g t minus p of t dt is less than 2 epsilon by 3. Okay, so now we are ready. Integral a to b g t sin n t dt, the cosine is similar, the cosine integral is similar, is integral a to b add and subtract a p t g t minus p t into sin n t d t absolute plus integral from a to b p of t into sin n t d t the whole thing absolute. Take the absolute value inside the first integral not the second one. Second one keep the absolute value outside. In the first integral take the absolute value inside integral a to b mod g t minus p t d t mod sin n t is less than 1, no problem. The first piece, integral a to b mod g t minus p t d t is less than 2 epsilon by 3, we just proved that. The second piece, integral a to b p of t sin n t d t, but we have checked that the riemann lebesgue lemma is true for polynomials. So the second piece, integral a to b p of t sin nt dt goes to 0. So there exists an n naught 
सच दैट फॉर एन ग्रेटर दैन इक्वल टू एन नॉट द सेकेंड पीस इज ऑल्सो लेस देन एप्सिलॉन बाय थ्री सो ऑल एन ऑल वी गेट इंटीग्रल ए टू बी जी ऑफ टी साइन एन टी डी टी द होल थिंग इन एप्सिलूट इज लेस देन एप्सिलॉन फॉर एन ग्रेटर दैन इक्वल टू एन नॉट एंड द प्रूफ ऑफ द रीमान लेबैग लेमा इज देयर बाय कंप्लीटेड ओके सो दैट इज अ वेरी नाइस प्रूफ लेट मी सजेस्ट अ सेकेंड प्रूफ let me suggest a second proof take for example an l1 function take an l1 function on the interval a to b g g belongs to l1 of a to b now suppose if g would be a step function what's a step function step function means take the interval a to b chop it up into finitely many pieces call a no a equal to t not T not T one T two T three da 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 T k T k equal to b. So just take finitely many points in the interval a to b. On each piece, T not to T one, it's constant. T one to T two, it is another constant. T two to T three, some other constant. So it's discontinuous, but it's a step function. Now for a step function. it is very easy to prove riemann lebesgue lemma because what is a step function a step function is a linear combination of characteristic functions of the intervals right suppose that is the characteristic function of an interval tj tj plus 1 then what happens to the riemann lebesgue lemma integral tj tj plus 1 sin nt dt you have to show that goes to zero that is clear you can integrate and check so it is true for characteristic functions of intervals therefore it is true for step functions and step functions are dense in l1 that's another way of proving the riemann lebesgue lemma whichever one is to your taste take up that take up that particular proof so the riemann lebesgue lemma is proved so now let us take stock of the situation so the what is the uh, what is the issue the issue with continuous functions f of x is merely assumed to be continuous then we know that the point wise convergence fails but it was believed by many that the point wise convergence holds including dirichlet until paul dubois raymond after several abortive attempts at proving it produced a counter example in 1875 using ideas from point set topology specifically the bayer category theorem you can show that the majority of the continuous functions display such an errant behavior a simplified proof was given by stephen banach in fact you use the banach steinhaus's theorem to produce a counter example the banach steinhaus's theorem not only produces a counter example it tells you that this kind of errant behavior is true for a majority of the continuous functions we shall give this proof using the banach steinhaus's theorem later in the course but now let us continue a little further having proved a nice theorem we should look at a few examples let us look at a simple case namely f of x equal to mod x when mod x is less than or equal to pi do a 2 pi periodic extension extend it 2 pi uh, as a 2 pi periodic function so the mod function is like a v the mod function is like a v and then you just extend it and you get like a sawtooth you get a infinite sawtooth profile right now from the graph it is very clear that the function is continuous in fact it is lipschitz continuous so it is even better than holder continuity good now we know that the function f of x equal to mod x is an even function it's a nice even function and the extension is also an even function so when you take an even function what happens what is the formula for bn you see it right here displayed in the slide here it is bn equal to 1 upon pi integral minus pi to pi f of x sin nx t sin is an odd function our f of x is an even function so the product of an even function and an odd function is an odd function when you integrate an odd function from minus pi to pi 
you're going to get zero. So all the BNs are zero. So the Fourier series will not involve the BNs, it will only involve the ANs. What is A naught? A naught is 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi to pi mod x dx. But being an even function, it will be twice integ the integral from 0 to pi. And this is 1 upon 2 pi, so it will be 1 upon pi. So what will it be? It will be 1 upon pi integral 0 to pi x dx. And that is easy to integrate. And you see the A naught is simply pi by 2. A naught is simply pi by 2. Now you need to calculate a n, a n will be 1 upon pi integral minus pi to pi mod x cos n x. Mod x is even, cos is even, the product is an even function, it will be twice integral from 0 to pi. So 2 upon pi integral 0 to pi x cos n x. You will have to perform an integration by parts and you have to be careful when you do the calculations because if you make a mistake, you are going to get it all wrong. You do the calculation carefully and diligently, you will get the ANs, put it in the equation for the Fourier expansion, f of x equal to A naught plus summation n from 1 to infinity, A n cos n x because the B n is 0. And this is exactly what you get. Our basic convergence theorem, this must hold for all values of x. Since it's a Lipschitz function, the Fourier series will converge pointwise to the given function f of x everywhere. So we get this beautiful representation of mod x as a Fourier series. Now what do you get when x is 0? Put x equal to 0, the cosine term becomes 1. So you get when x is 0, you get pi by 2 equal to summation 4 upon pi denominator 2k minus 1 the whole square. Do a little bit of rearrangement, you are going to get pi squared by 8, you will get pi squared by 8 equals 1 plus 1 upon 3 squared plus 1 upon 5 squared plus 1 upon 7 squared plus dot dot dot. You get that the sum of the reciprocals of squares of the odd numbers is pi squared by 8. As an exercise, determine 1 plus 1 upon 2 squared plus 1 upon 3 squared plus 1 upon 4 squared plus da da da. You are supposed to get pi squared by 6. Do this as an exercise now. I think this would be a very nice place to stop this capsule and we will continue this in the next capsule. Thank you very much.